I'll just lead in. Okay, um, th this is the gun that we just mounted this scope on. We mounted this 4 to 16. And I actually, I wanted to show people something about the physical size difference of these scopes. Because that's also something guys are always asking me. They're agonizing over which scope should they get. And so, I actually want to show you to compare them to each other. So there's, a, there's, okay, wait, let's start here. Here's a 5 to 25, right? It's a big scope, and I try to impress that upon people. It's a big scope. I mean, physically, a large scope. All right, so right beside it, you have a four to 16. Here, I'm gonna try to, try to do this so people can see. And then there, right beside it, is a straight 10. Obviously, the straight 10 is more than what you might consider to be a normal size scope. And then the four to 16, eh, a little bit on the big side, and then the five to 25 is obviously a great big heavy scope. I mean, you could just beat your moose to death with that thing rather than shoot it, but the point is it's big. So you have to, when you're mounting scopes on a gun, you gotta decide what's the gun, what's the ultimate purpose of the gun? You know, how far are you gonna shoot? But you also have to decide too what the ultimate weight is gonna be of the guns because, I mean, this scope is relatively light. I don't know, I think this is under two pounds. This scope is definitely over two pounds. This scope is over three pounds, okay? So you gotta make that decision. The other thing you also have to decide is, you know, how, how does it, how do they fit together? How do they complement each other? Because if you've got a great big massive gun, say 338 Lapua, it already weighs 12 pounds, putting this on it is the right thing to do because it's not gonna make the gun too top heavy. But say you've got a little, you know, seven pound gun that's gonna be a sheep rifle, well you certainly don't wanna put this on it. You might want to put this on it, but more than likely, you're going to want to put like this straight 10 on it. All right, and I just wanted to show the physical difference in the size of these scopes so that maybe it'll alleviate the next 2,000 phone calls that I'll get this year because people call me about this stuff all the time. And so now you get to physically see straight 10, 4 to 16 by 50, 5 to 25 by 56. Those are the three main scopes we use. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, so here we are again. It's 11, 17, 17. This is the same gun that we just did the, the assembly, the disassembly, reassembly, um, little bit, a little short video with. And what we're going to do now is, is this gun, we're going to mount a scope on it. Um, this gun, like I said, has already been test fired with one of my scopes. And this is the scope that we're actually going to be mounting for the customer. And this is Schmidt Bender 4 to 16 by 50 Police Marksman 2. And you can see all the designations hopefully there on the end of the box. This is probably one of our most favorite hunting scopes. And I'm talking about for the medium sized guns. On the big guns, we mount the 5 to 25s like that over there, which you'll see just in a minute. And in a few more minutes, maybe about 10 minutes from now, you'll see that we also mount a lot of these straight tens. And this is our probably our favorite scope for the light guns. So we have scopes that match up, the straight 10 for the lighter weight guns. We have the four to 16 that goes on most of the guns. And then we have the five to 25 that ends up on the big guns. The only reason that's on that gun at this very moment is because I was out testing. And I, you know, obviously I want the magnification to test. So here this is, um, these things are really nice. Okay, I do mean really nice. Um, you might wanna notice and in fact, I may have to stop here for a, fact, for a second to show you, but we, almost every gun we build has a rail on it, okay? There's a reason for that. Rails, to some degree, stiffen the receiver. So, you'll notice on here right now, I mean, obviously, this is a Stellar TAC 300. This rail comes, the way it comes out of the box, is with four 840 screws and two dial pins. All right, I don't like that dial pin arrangement. I've seen them come loose. So what I've been doing now for, I bet you at least the last five years is, I drill the holes where, drill the holes, the, the rail and the receiver, and I put six 840 screws in these. And the fact is, six 840 screws, it's not coming loose, it's just not. Now, I am actually, while I'm here, I'm gonna show you, here, actually I can show you right here. This, this is a bat HR. It's a bat HR and it's a solid bottom, which is one of the best ways, by the way, for building a lot of the 
of the cartridges use of the cartridges that have long cartridge overall lengths. This is going to be a 28 nozzler for shooting 195 grain burgers. But here's the deal. We were talking about rails, and that's why I came over here. Obviously, this rail is integral, machined into it from the beginning, from one blank of steel. There is absolutely no better, there's no better system, because the rail can never come loose. It can never come off. It just entirely eliminates one potential problem. So, and the other thing about rails, there's one more thing about rails. Um, you know, those stillers, they do not have a recoil shoulder on them because of the nature of way, the way they're made. But if you're buying rails and you have a choice between buying a rail with a recoil shoulder or without, buy the one with the recoil shoulder. And again, you have to take, to take into consideration also, we're talking about fairly hard kicking guns and we're talking about big heavy scopes. I mean, you might get away with a lot of things, you know, with 22 to 50s and stuff like that, 243s. But when you start shooting 338 Lapuas with three pound scopes, you need to you need to have the best mounting system possible, which is a lead in into this. And again, this isn't a commercial. This is actually what we use. These are Badger Max 50s, and we use these almost exclusively because they really, really, really work. So here they are. This is, this is a six screw ring. And I mean, it's as heavy duty as, as you could possibly want. We have never, ever, ever, ever had a single problem with these. And, and by the way, guys will ask, well, you know, do you need to lap them? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you don't do anything with these. You mount them on the gun, mount them properly, and you go and just trust me, you will never, ever have any problems. These things are really awesome. But unfortunately, they're really expensive also, but um, they are worth it. So um, what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna mount this scope on this gun, on this rail. Um, again, this rail and everything's pulled down tight. We've already shot this gun. So the first thing you have to do here is you need to get the gun, get the gun level. So there's a lot of different ways to do that, but this is the way I do it. So I put these little bubble levels on here. And then what I do is I actually level the gun. Okay, and I want this to be fairly tight in here because I don't want it moving around. So we also have this type. And I use this type too, but it's easier to, if you have a rail, it's just easier to set it on the rail. But you can also set it on the receiver. And by the way, that's also one of the ways of checking, checking the, the receiver manufacturers, checking their work. Because sometimes they aren't always square, unless it's a bat. If it's a bat, it's always square. All right, so. Get the gun top dead center, close as you can get it to perfect. And we're going to need to take this out of here then, but we will come back and check it. You need to... That's a half inch wrench. I use it so much I forgot what it was. So we're just going to set that on there for the time being. And again, I do this all the time. Hopefully I'll get it about where it should be. I think on these, they go about right about there. But we'll see here in a minute. Now, this is kind of important. And here, I'm just gonna hand tighten these for a second so they don't move around while I'm, while I'm trying to take those screws out. When you take the screws out, put the screws back in the same hole that they came out of, and do not rotate or switch the rings. In other words, this cap goes to this ring and it goes this way. Again, I, I'm really fanatical about that, but we never have any problems. And I think, what I'm about to say, I think that these are line board. In other words, I think they're made as one piece and that's one of the reasons why they fit so good. So you want them to stay the way that they are, the way that they came. 
So I take that cap and just set it right there, and that's exactly the way it's going to go back. And I'll do the same thing with this one. Okay. The way it came off is the way I'm setting it down. Now, make sure there's nothing in here. Set that in there and see what we got. Obviously our spacing is wrong. So we're going to have to come back on the front one. At least one, maybe more. Okay, we're going to have to move one more yet. So I'm going to move this one forward, I think. I might have to move the other one back one more. All right, well, that would give us our spacing. But now what we have to see is, and you need to get that camera out of my way, we have to see where we're at here. And that is too long. Um, average, here, let me do something. I know about where that goes for myself. Um, when I mount a scope for another guy, unless he says that he's exceptionally short or exceptionally tall, I like it from right at the top of the, from the top of the recoil pad, right to the edge of the, the eyepiece, I like it to be 11 and a quarter and 11 and a half. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to move this one back one more. And we may need to move that one back also because I don't want the spacing. I want, I want to get as hold of it as much as I can. And so that's going to be the deal. We can move that one one to the rear. All right, now let's see where we're at. Um, 11 and a half. Thing is, I don't know if I want to move that to the rear anymore. And I can't, I can't go anymore that way, so let me see. 11 and a half. Yeah. See, the deal is, too, I want to be... I want to be aware of where I'm at on the rail here. In other words, I want these, I want these as, as far apart on the tube and on the rail as I can get. In other words, I don't want, I don't want to... All right, well, that's where it's going to be. It's going to be 11 and a half because if I go one more, I'm going to have to move that, that ring further back, and that gives me good spacing right there. Now, I want to go back and show you something. You've probably been noticing that I want to make sure that you realize you have to hold that ring forward. Now, you think about it. The gun recoils to the rear. So hold the ring up against the recoil shoulder on the rail, in the Picatinny rail. And then hand tighten that and do the same thing with this one. I suppose these don't have to be absolutely perfect, but that's the way I like them. And in fact, that still is not quite perfect. All right, now set this back up here. I want to check it once more and see where we're at. Okay, 11 and a half. Um, so now the next thing is, and we still remember, we still have that level sitting there in the receiver. So what we want to do next is, and you can do it with one like this, because you got a nice flat spot there. Or, you know, you can get really anal, which I'm going to. Oh, and one more thing I want to point out. What can I use for a pointer? You notice here, 
that I split the difference. In other words, I don't want this right up against that bell. In other words, the transition spot. I want to stay back away from that a little bit, and I definitely want to stay back away from this a little bit. So what I did is, if you can tell, and I don't know that you can, I split the difference. I split the difference. So I'm back off of this a little bit, and I'm back off of that a little bit. And in fact, I'm going to... Right there, I would say, is about halfway from one to the other. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to lay my steel rule back on top of there. And I'm going to square that up. And you notice that our other level, our level that's on the receiver, we haven't moved the gun. So now, remember, I didn't tighten these. Those are only hand tight. I did that for a reason. And initially here, I'm only going to use the middle screw. I'm going to use my thumbnail for a spacer because I want to try to get these even. You can really tell people don't know what they're doing when they mount rings and they've got one side completely, just com when they mount ring caps, I should say, they got one side completely smashed down and they got a big gap on the other side. Well, that's not professional. Okay. I need back there. You need to actually look at it too to make sure that it's right. Um, I need to see the other side also. So I got a little mirror right here because I'm not going to move the gun. If anything, if anything, both of those are pulled down just a little bit more. So I'm going to pull this down just a little bit more. And then I'm going to see if they're even. They are, and I'm going to pull that down just a little bit more. This one's starting to get tight, so I need to let up a little bit on that one. All right, so now, Look at your levels, watch your bubbles, see where we're at. And what I'm gonna do now is, well actually first I'm gonna make sure that it is where I think it is. I'm gonna make sure that it's right. We're gonna pull on them back ones first then, which is good because that center bubbles laying this way. So I'm just tightening the center one. Okay. And you have to watch as you do this because it can try to rotate the scope. Which is good because if anything I had it set that other way just a hair. Alright. Again, only the center one. Now they're starting to come tight, okay. All right, now, you do this just like you do the, the lug pattern on a wheel. I'm going to tighten that one, and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to tighten this one. And then this one. And then it's opposite. And I'm not really cranking them down. Arrow's a better light. All 
All right, now I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna do it over again, give it a little bit of torque. We don't really need this on here now. This is not going anywhere, trust me. The thing about these rings, and this having six screws, is they will really pull down. And I, I mean really pull down. So you gotta kinda watch that you don't go too tight because It'll just keep sucking it up and sucking it up and sucking it up and I don't know where where that process would end. I know it won't crush a Schmidt bender tube, but let me tell you, it'll put down a serious amount of serious amount of torque. Okay, so what we're gonna do is is this is just a cheap torque wrench, but I've got it set at about, I don't know, twenty, about twenty-five. So now I'm gonna use the torque wrench on it. In that same pattern. Okay, now I'm gonna back over them one more time. Yes, I know it's overkill. Thing is, using this system, we've never had a scope slip. We've never had one, I mean, they don't even go out of zero. Nothing, it just it just works. This, this you know, actually, you know, obviously, the ultimate system is the bat with an integral rail, with these rings, with one of these scopes. I mean, it just works. All right, that's that. Now, last thing to do, and don't forget to do this, is tighten these down. And again, there is a torque setting for them. I think it's like, ah, I better not say, because I'm not sure. But I never use a wrench on these. I never use a torque wrench on these. I just do it by hand, by feel, I guess I should say. And you can tell. You can tell when it's, when it's tight enough, but not too tight. Because if you really cranked on that, you could probably snap that off, and you don't need to do that. Remember, it's on an aluminum rail. When it's on the steel rails, it comes up tight, and you feel it come up tight. And then there is no more give. Okay, now, so I want to check my check what we got here again. And that's good. Um, I think that's it for this one. Um, Yeah, I think that's good. We'll take this gun out and we'll shoot it and zero it up for the fala and then we'll ship it off to him. Okay, thanks. Okay, so a minute ago we were just talking about scope sizes and what scope to put on what gun. So I actually thought I would show you this gun. Um, this is a 260 for a fellow that has other guns of mine. Um, this is a fairly light gun. I haven't weighed this gun. I would say it weighs about seven and a half pounds. Um, it's on a Stiller TAC 30. Um, I think this is a Krieger and um, it's got a jewel in it. It's got Macmillan bottom metal. This is a Macmillan HTG. Now this gun is going to be purely a hunting gun. So we didn't show you, but just a minute ago, I just took this big 5 to 25 off of it, all right? And I guess maybe I, it, it is good to show you this. Okay, obviously, this scope is massive for this gun. I had it on there because we take the guns out and we test fire them. And I need every bit of magnification that I can get within reason to be able to shoot small groups. But the gun is already, we've already shot the small groups. It's a really good shooting gun. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to put the scope on it that he's going to use as a hunting scope, and that is this Schmidt Bender Straight 10. Um, these are really nice scopes. This has a uh, P3 reticle in it, which is a mill dot reticle. Um, these things, I, I own two of these, personally own two of these, and I have killed elk with these at, and truthfully I can't remember, 750 yards. Um, even at 1,000 yards, these are fine for elk. Whitetails, uh, antelope, 
they start to look pretty small if you're really going to be shooting those kind of distances. Um, a scope like this on whitetails for me is about maybe a 600 yard, 650, maybe 700 yard scope. After that, I want more magnification because I want to be able to see better. But we're going to put this on here and I, we're going to do everything we just did with the other one. And so what I think we're going to do is, is we're going to go ahead and film it and then we'll run it through fast forward so you get to see what the end result is because there's no reason to go back over everything we just did. All right. You know, earlier, we were talking about this sear coming up, and when it's dirty, or when it's cold weather, or whatever, and I was making mention of the fact, you know, that these, these triggers are precision instruments, um, and they have tight tolerances in them, and so something that came to my mind while I was standing here is to tell people, don't trust your safeties. I mean, anybody that trusts a safety is a moron, okay? A safety, you think about what you've got here. You've got this real small amount of engagement between here, you know, and the, and the bottom of the caulking piece on the firing pin, all right? To walk around with a loaded gun with the safety on is about the biggest unsafe thing you could possibly do. I mean, the safety, that's a misnomer in every, every way, shape, or form. There is no such thing as a safety. The only safety is don't point the gun at anybody and don't do anything stupid. Okay, so here's the deal though. With these really precise triggers, it's even more important, okay? More important because, you know, a lot of these triggers on our guns, they're usually set at about 20, 24 ounces, okay? Two pounds on the heavy side. That's not very much engagement. And to be, you know, having a loaded gun with that level of engagement, with that precise of an instrument, I mean, it's just not smart. So what I'm saying here is, and this is how we actually, this is how we use our guns ourselves, how we hunt ourselves. We never, ever, ever put a live round in the chamber, ever. Not until we're actually ready to shoot. And what I mean is, you know, say we see, see a deer or an elk. Okay, we're walking around or riding a horse or whatever with, uh, with an unloaded gun. In other words, no ammunition in the gun at all. And when it comes time to shoot, you know, we get into position, get everything set up for the shot, and then put a loaded round directly in the chamber, usually just one, obviously just one in the chamber, but I mean not even any shells in the magazine. The safety's already off, close the bolt on it, and go ahead and shoot your deer or elk or antelope or whatever. And that's it. It's a one-shot deal. So the safety never even plays a role in it. But I just wanted to you know, point out the fact that safeties are really, I mean, like I said, it's, it's a big-time misnomer. They're not really safe. 
And so don't trust them, don't rely on them. And if you can establish a, you know, a, a protocol like we do, you just, you, you never put a loaded shell in the gun. Well, if there's never a, a, if there's never a loaded round in the chamber, you can never have an accident. Simple as that. I just thought I'd bring that up.